I'm very uneasy to be here because um, I must recollect that when I came into the school planning 50 years ago, I was as far removed from the events of 1916 as I am today from the foundation of the school. And it occurs to me that we can't fully understand the dynamics that created the school of planning without going back to that extraordinary revolutionary generation of 1916, and particularly to the personalities that dominated and that dominate our own imagination. Pierce and de Valera. And I think it's interesting to consider whether or not the backgrounds of these two individuals in any way are relevant to the environment that we're growing up in today. Pierce was a Dublin man born and bred. He lived in Brunswick Street. His father was a monumental sculptor. Um, Pierce wrote in 1906 that he wished Dublin to be a city of shady boulevards and cafes. And in the week before 1916, he talked about the need for gracious towns. In his own school in Collinswood, he had paintings by Yeats, by, by George Russell. Pierce was essentially an aesthete. And had he lived, it would have been interesting to see. I think he probably would have interested himself in the beautification of cities. Um, indeed, it's not unthinkable that if he lived to 1948 and his nationalistic um, ambitions had been satisfied, that he would have been a founder member of Antashka. De Valera, on the other hand, was quite another matter. I'm falling behind. That's Dublin in Pierce's time. And that's the little village of Brewery where Dev grew up and which he always related to. He left it when he was 17. He never went back. But he continually, it was Brewery which was in the back of his mind. He was a mathematician. He had no particular interest in the arts. I had a very long conversation with him about 45 years ago. He hadn't the slightest interest, I can tell you, in architecture or town planning. All he would talk about was um, the damp in his flat in Oris and Ochtheron. Um, Dev was obsessed with one thing which was keeping people on the land, and I think there's no harm in quoting it, but we're all very familiar with his famous Patrick's Day speech of 1943 about uh, happy people, comely maidens dancing in the countryside. So they're two different early environments, but the one thing that unites them is their nationalist viewpoint of, um, that, of independence. They believed that if th there was national independence, that the country would be um, economically successful. Uh, Pierce thought the population would probably grow to between 20 and 30 million. De Valera thought that th that was a bit much. Probably somewhere between eight and nine million would suffice. The one thing they both agreed on was that, na that uh, national independence would be transformative. And that could be achieved by uh, restricting the import of foreign goods, capital, relying on indigenous resources, um, intensifying agricultural production, in particular, no heavy industry, Pierce said, no Glasgow's, no Pittsburgh's. And essentially, they particularly were obsessed about slums and the, um, they had a distaste for a discontented urban proletariat because they believed that that would lead to, um, probably to uh, godlessness, and uh, a lack of spirituality, that is very much the view of the church at the time. And this image of, by James Humbert Craig is essentially the image that appealed to Pearson de Valera of a simple people living in sim simple circumstances and uh, attending to their religion. Pierce was executed, and we'll never know what would have happened had this fascinating man lived. Dev got into government. And he immediately implements the Sinn Féin policies of, of sufficiency and all that, of independence. Um, and the first thing 
he does when he gets into power. The first two initiatives of the new Fianna Fáil government are fascinating. The first one is a transformative housing drive. Um, and between 1932 and 1945, or 1942, I think something like 82,000 um, houses were built, both public and, and private, which given the population at the time is not a bad track record in view of our own rather poor track record today. The second initiative was the, the um, bringing forward of a planning act, which is very surprising because it wasn't in the Fianna Fáil uh, uh, manifesto at the time. And the only reason I think it was brought in was there was feeling that planning was vaguely modern and it was a good thing, but there was no call for it. And indeed, as um, uh, Sean O'Leary points out in his excellent book, uh, very few of the local authorities actually, actually um, um, uh, adopted it. The only reason it did get adopted was because of the housing drive and if one was going to acquire sites, and the minister was talking earlier about the need for acquiring difficult properties, if you're going to acquire it, you need some context. So if you, you, the context has to come from a plan. So my um, Frank Gibney that I've been doing a lot of work on, Frank Gibney got a lot of work during the 30s to prepare the most absolutely absurd town plans. But their purpose really was simply to, to, to um, create a context for, for very large housing schemes and all the civic design stuff. You could forget about that, but it looked lovely at the time. So the 34 Act was a total, effectively a total failure, other than its giving context to housing. And it didn't really matter because by the 1942, the country was going on the tubes anyway. With the Second World War, industrial production had declined by 25%. And by the 1950s, a half million people left the country. So things had to change. And it just couldn't go on like that. And they did when Dev eventually left. Sean Lamas came in. And the, uh, the wind changed immediately. Um, foreign direct investment was permitted. Uh, new capital came in. And in particular, um, we applied for uh, membership of the EEC, and in particular, economic planning was, came, came into being, the first programme for economic development. And I remember vividly, in 63, it seemed to ch the wind seemed to change overnight, and economic planning was seen as highly successful, and it just really changed the whole atmosphere. And of course, once you've economic planning was seen to change, the next thing on the agenda was physical planning. And then from that, you get um, the need for planners to implement the Planning Act and correspondingly the planning school whose anniversary we're celebrating here today. So to a certain extent, I'm begging the question, you know, are we here today celebrating a school founded on the ruins? of the dreams of De Valera and Pierce? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that um, the problem with revolutionaries, and we can see this with the death of Fidel Castro in the last few days, is that the reasons why they come to power um, frequently are not relevant once they achieve power. And the problem is, these are the ideas that drive the revolution. And it's very difficult for the revolutionaries themselves to uh, back off from those ideas. And that was very much the case with Dev. He couldn't resign from the, the, the vision that had brought him to power in the first instance. On the other hand, the reality is that by creating national independence, the, we were given the opportunity to do, to make our own plans. And to use that phrase, which I've never understood why it fell into disrepair, is to have Irish solutions to Irish problems. I think there's nothing wrong with Irish solutions to Irish problems. So in 1966, we entrance to the new planning course, found ourselves very much in a new world. 
and I hesitate to use, it's a very much misused quotation from Wordsworth, but bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. It was a very exciting time. The staff were one day ahead of the students. We were making it up as we went along. It was really very good fun. And uh, the only problem, I think, in the early days at least, was that because we didn't have our own models, we tended to look over our shoulders to a certain degree at the experiences of elsewhere of more urbanized economies and whose um, economic development, whose population structures, whose culture might not have been entirely irrelevant. And for example, I cringe when I look at this student exercise which I produced for the Liberties area of Dublin uh, based on Buchanan's um, Traffic in Towns in which I think I obliterated most of the liberties and uh, uh, it was absurd, it was illiterate, uh, I got honours. <laughs> Nevertheless, driven by inspiring teachers and enthusiastic students, the school flourished and it began to contribute to Irish society as its graduates made their mark in both the private and public sectors in the operation of the Irish planning system. But I would have to say that unlike other socio-cultural phenomena such as uh, live line or the smoking ban or uh, the Rosa Tralee competition, the Irish planning system has never been very much clasped to the bosom of the great Irish public. And there are a myriad reasons for that. Our post-colonial past, we're rural, we're conservative, we have a low population density, we're still relatively undeveloped economy. We're suspicious of grand plans and we're suspicious of those who propose them. We're individualistic, we like laissez-faire, but we have a strong sense of private property and the ability to do with what we like. Until recently, we were not a particularly urbanized society and we're not very good at sharing space. And I think for the students amongst you, they're things that you're going to have to take aboard because it are those attitudes that will determine the success or failure of your future careers. But there is one phenomenon that has worked extremely well and which the Irish public does love, and that is planned dead urbanism. And in uh, Don Leary, in Clonakilty, in Westport, in Docklands, urban schemes which start at strategic level, work down through the development plan, go through a part eight process, uh, consultation, agreement, um, disagreement, adoption, and then they're built out by planners and architects. They have proved extremely successful and the public likes them very, very much. And that's the one area in my experience where planners actually uh, are lauded. And that's why I'm delighted to see the co cooperation between the schools of planning and architecture and engineering, now augmented by environmental policy and landscape architecture, and by the addition of an urban design course. And I urge an ever closer union. And I look forward to the creative dynamic which that will result. 47 years separate the foundations of the School of Planning and Architecture. And in that time, the graduates of the School of Architecture, Grafton Architects, um, uh, O'Donnell Toomey, have conquered the world. And I have little doubt that some of the students sitting here this evening will stand on that same international stage. When I referred to Wordsworth earlier, of course he was talking about the French Revolution, about which he later became disillusioned. Um, I think he should probably have taken the view of Jean Lai, who, when he was asked about what would be the legacy of the French Revolution, replied, it's much too early to tell. I don't think it's too early to tell or to say that the School of Planning has reached great success and 
we can look forward, we can wave to its staff and students as it goes forward on the next 50 years, which I think will be even more glorious. Long live the school planning UCD. Yeah.